The program was brought to you with support from the Alberta L. Brown Lectureship Endowment Fund. This lectureship was established in 1975 by the Upjohn Company to honor the company's first head librarian, Alberta Brown, um, and uh, who established the company's research library. The purpose of the lectureship is to invite recognized experts in areas directly relevant to librarianship in library science, information science, to share expertise with those who are in the library profession and beyond. So many of our community members are, who are here tonight. In academia, we sometimes feel that higher education is immune to book challenges, that this is a K through 12 school system or a public library issue. But what happens in our schools, in our libraries, and in our communities does have an impact on our institutions, our universities. While we may not encounter situations where we have direct challenges to books in our academic libraries, we are seeing increased constraints on free speech and academic freedom taking place at institutions of higher education across the country. Just this week in the Chronicle of Higher Education, there were situations that were highlighted in Idaho, North Dakota, Iowa, Texas, Oklahoma, and Florida, where public universities face increased pressure to censor faculty, adjust programming and curricula, and navigate new state laws and hinder intellectual freedom and free speech. These kinds of stories bombard us in the news on a weekly, if not daily basis. So we are privileged to have with us an expert on information access, intellectual freedom, and censorship, who will help us understand the implications of the increase in book challenges we're seeing across the country. Dr. Emily Knox is an associate professor in the School of Information Sciences at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She's published two books, banning, book banning in the 21st Century America and Foundations of Intellectual Freedom covering these issues. She's also recently edited the book Trigger Warnings, History, Theory, and Context and co-edited Foundations of Information Ethics. Emily's articles have been published in the Library Quarterly, Library and in Information Science Research, Open Information Science, and the Journal of Intellectual Freedom and Privacy. She serves on the board of National Coalition Against Censorship and is the editor of the Journal of Intellectual Freedom and Privacy. And has been interviewed by media outlets such as NPR, The Washington Post, Time, and Slate. She received her PhD from the doctoral program at the Rutgers University School of Communication and Information, her master's in library and information science from the I School at Illinois, a BA in religious studies from Smith College, and an AM in the same field from the University of Chicago Divinity School. So now with that, I um, will turn it over to Emily Knox. Please help join me in welcoming her. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. Um, I have been giving a lot of talks about uh, intellectual freedom, banned books, obviously because we are in such an interesting time when it comes to challenges to intellectual freedom. So I do have prepared remarks and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have afterwards. I really learn from all of you um, and I try to think about what people are asking me and incorporate that into my work as I'm going forward. I know what questions I have, but I really want to hear what questions you have. So just a little bit about banned books. My mom was a high school librarian for 32 years. And we always observed, that's the best word I can think of for it, Banned Books Week. So I really loved to read. I especially loved reading Judy Blum's books. And I was just horrified that people would try to remove her books from schools or public libraries. Um, I also have to say that 
I uh, serve on the board of the National Coalition Against Censorship, and Judy Bloom was also on that board. And so some of my best days ever would be when I would get an email from Judy Bloom. I cannot describe how great that was. So this was always a driving force for me, which is to think about why do people try to ban books? What is the point of this? So I'm going to start with a couple definitions. First, intellectual freedom. I should say that this is a word that most people don't use. This is really um, part of librarianship. We talk about intellectual freedom a lot. Most people talk about free speech, which is actually something a little bit different. But I will give you a definition of intellectual freedom. Intellectual freedom is the right of every individual to both seek and receive information from all points of view without restriction. It provides for free access to all expressions of ideas through which any sides or in all sides of a question, cause, or movement may be explored. Censorship, on the other hand, is its opposite. It's a suppression of ideas and information that certain persons, individuals, groups, or government officials find dangerous or objectionable. So these are definitions from the American Library Association. What I really do in my work is to look at intellectual freedom a little bit more broadly, and I apologize that this is hard to read. I should have changed this to black ink. But I just want to go through some of the issues in intellectual freedom. So if we start at the top, we can see that I do talk a little bit about the legal issues. So I work at the NCAC with a lot of lawyers um, who are First Amendment lawyers. Um, and they talk quite a bit about what is allowed by the law when it comes to exploring ideas. I also talk a lot about philosophical issues. So these are things like ethics, morality. There's always a question of neutrality within librarianship. Um, and as you, I, as you heard before, I edited a book on um, information ethics. This is really looking at information access. Then we have privacy. I cannot stress enough how important privacy is to intellectual freedom. So here's another story about that. When ebooks first started and became more popular, there was a marked rise in the sale of romance novels. Now, that might surprise some people, but if you think about it, it actually isn't surprising because when you have an ebook reader, no one knows what you're reading. No one can see the cover. They don't know what you're doing. So in fact, there was a huge increase, and in actually across all genres, um, but especially romance novels, when you have the ebook come out. Why? Because your information is private when you read on an ebook. This is also something that comes up in librarianship with issues like records management. Next, a little bit about access. So this is issues of things like classification, uh, selection. I always emphasize bibliography. So bibliography is an, uh, it's just one of those research methods that people don't talk about enough, but I cannot stress how many times I have had someone call me over the past two years how many times has the bluest eye been challenged? What was the outcome of those challenges? There are places to find that information, but they are not all consolidated. I just want to say that it's imperative that we keep track because what you actually see over time is that when you look at books that have been banned, you can see what people are thinking about in society. What are the disruptions that are taking place. So my hope is that we will have a very good bibliography come out of this time. And also, I just want to stress that bibliography is an incredibly important research method. Also, policy. I love talking about policy. Um, policies are always important, even if people don't follow, follow them, because you can't say that you didn't follow the policy if you don't have a policy. So I often emphasize to people that you must have updated policies and look at them on a regular basis. 
So that's basically just an overview of how you might think about intellectual freedom. It actually is not as narrow as it seems at first. There are a lot of different issues that are part of um, this topic. So now I wanna talk a little about censorship. So one thing I have found is that people dislike being called censors, right? It's like being called racist or something like that. So people will say like, I'm not a censor. I am just trying to, for example, protect children or something of that sort. So when I think about it in my research, what I really focus on is this idea that we all engage in censorship practices. This kind of lowers the temperature a bit more. So for example, I don't read horror. It is just not my thing. I like to be able to sleep. It's not, I'm not interested in reading horror. I will only watch horror movies if they are true classics, usually with all the lights on in the middle of the day on Saturday, right? So someone said to me, you must watch The Exorcist. Okay, I'll watch it. But only in like a place that I am very comfortable, definitely not in a movie theater. So in some ways, I'm engaging in a censorship practice, right? I'm restricting a particular genre for myself. So what are censorship practices? I use the four R's, redaction, restriction, relocation, and removal. So let me go through those slowly. Redaction is basically when you draw a line through something. So if you look at like a classified document, you'll see that the information is redacted and actually I have an example of a redacted document a little bit later. But also people redact things because they dislike them. So I'm sure many of you heard about the mouse um, incident that took place in Tennessee. So before they removed mouse from the curriculum altogether, they actually drew through what they didn't like. So all of the bad words, um, the picture of, it actually was a picture of a naked woman in a bathtub. Um, they drew through that. That is a type of redaction. The next active practice is restriction. So when we think about restriction, what is really important is the intended audience. So sometimes well, people will say, well, this should be moved from, for example, in a public library, the juvenile section to the young adult section, even though the author intended it to be for juveniles. So you really have to think about who is the intended audience for this work when you think about something being restricted. So restricted just basically means putting it behind the desk, asking for permission slips, those sorts of things. That's a restricted access. Relocation is similar. You're moving it from where people who are intended to get it easily actually can go, you'll set it to like the adult section. That's usually what happens. Or if it's a book about sexual education, it'll get moved to a so-called parent section. Just as an aside, this is very interesting to me because it shows you how people think about libraries as if they have these like fences up between the different sections of the library, which is just not true. Um, but it also thinks about, it tells you what we think about classification, how performative it is. When a book is a J book, it is a J book. We call it a J book and then it becomes a J book. And it doesn't matter that someone can just walk over and get it. So in fact, people think about libraries as like having these strange fences. And just another um, anecdote, I remember when I was um, young and there was a book I wanted to read and it was in the adult section and not in the young adult section. First of all, I asked my mom if I could, if I was allowed to check out books from the adult section and she kind of laughed at me and was like, of course. And I remember moving in the library from the young adult section to the adult section and how it felt very different um, and how I was suddenly in this new world of books that I had never thought of before. So I guess I wanna say like, this is both something that is real and not real at the same time, right? It's something that we kind of internalize that there are these barriers in the library, but in fact, there aren't any barriers. Anybody can walk into any of those sections of the library, although I don't walk into teen sections because you feel very strange when you do that. So um, the last one is what most people think of as censorship, which is removal. 
but you have to be very careful with this. So where are you removing something from? This becomes especially important when we're thinking about school libraries or uh, challenges to books that are in schools. Is it being removed from the curriculum, from the library, from the summer reading program? These are all a little bit different. And when you look at the arguments that people use to remove a book, they actually can sometimes move the goalposts and say, well, we're removing it from the curriculum, but it's still in the library. Well, we're removing it from the library, but it's still in the public library. There are all these different ways of thinking about it. They're actually quite different. Um, I have trouble getting journalists, especially, to really think with nuance about like what case are you talking about? How, what are people requesting when they talk about moving books? So again, those active practice practices are redaction, restriction, relocation, and removal. I also work a little bit with passive practices. These are more internally to librarians. So this is idea or creators of works. So self-censorship, the idea that I'm not going to do something because I am worried that people will censor it. Um, and then bias. This mostly comes with issues of selection. I don't like that work. I don't like that author, and therefore I'm not going to select it. <clears throat> so what I study is something called the discourse of censorship. This is basically looking at the justifications that people use to say, yes, I want to remove or relocate or redact or restrict something. I look at relationships among power, identity, and the nature of knowledge. I'm very interested about the status of libraries and community. Um, libraries are kind of black boxes for people. They're actually quite magical. You go to a library and there are things available, right? You go to the new book section and that new book you wanted is just there. You turn on Libby. I actually was doing Libby on the way here. And I was like, I want to listen to this book while I'm driving up to Kalamazoo. And there it was, right? No one really knows how that happens. It's like a magical process. All of a sudden the book is, it's not just there. It has like a label and a book jacket. And like, then there are like games and all sorts of things, and how does that happen? Libraries are very, um, most people have no idea what goes on behind the scenes in a library. So I just wanna talk a little bit about this picture. This is actually from McMinn County, right after they banned mouse. So you'll see that this picture does not even show the crowd that went out the building. One of the reasons I love looking at book banning and book challenging challenges is that people get so excited about talking about books on either side, right? Um, you can hear the passion in their voice when they are saying, this book is so important. It's so important that I either wanna get rid of it or we should keep it. Um, and people will come out to a board meeting. Most board meetings, as people know, there's no one ever there, but they will come out for these meetings to discuss books. <clears throat> so I look at something called discursive censorship, really how people try to control knowledge. This is one of my favorite pictures. It's Mike Holtzneck. This is in Stockton, Missouri. It's about 15 years ago now. He is upset about the absolute true diet of a part-time Indian. He's a lawyer, so he's actually blown up the pictures he doesn't like to be able to talk to people about them. This is very common. It's so common, in fact, that it happened on the Senate floor. So this is Ted Cruz talking about anti-racist baby um, if you've ever seen the cover, this is what the baby is doing. Um, he was very upset about this. This is um, at Katanji Brown Jackson, Justice Jackson's um, uh, hearings. And you can see that he, in fact, did exactly what Mike Holtzent did. Blow up the pictures that he doesn't like, like to talk about them. So why am I interested in this? In some ways, banning books is an entirely futile act, right? What, what is the point of doing that? You can get books from Amazon, you can torrent books, you can borrow books. There are all sorts of things that you can do to actually get that knowledge. So what are people trying to accomplish 
when they say, I don't want this book in my community. So this is a little bit more on the theory that I look at. Um, I'm especially focusing on reading practices. Uh, I love this book by Stanley Fish. Is there a text in this class? He really talks about something called interpretive communities. This is the idea that the meaning of a text does not reside in a text. Instead, we bring our own baggage to whatever we're reading. Um, and it's this interpretation that creates meaning. And then people who share interpretations are part of an interpretive community. So I also recommend the ethnography of reading, especially Elizabeth Long's paper, which is about how reading is social. It's not something that happens in isolation. I actually need to work with my advisee at some point. We really would like to write a paper about book people. So these are the people who are on Goodreads and are just thinking about books all the time, and they use a lot of inclusive, like in community language, like DNF and all sorts of things, TBR, all these words about books. They share an interpretive community, and you can see how reading is social if you look through Goodreads. Finally, I just want to talk about this reading group right here. This is from Kutztown in Pennsylvania. It's the students started the reading group after books were banned in their school. Some other things I use for my theory is difficult knowledge. Um, basically, what we're seeing today um, is that people are worried about knowledge that many adults find challenging to address in their own lives, but especially with children. So this is from Kelly Robinson's book. It's really looking out about at this idea of how do we grow from being innocent, however we're thinking of the word innocent. How do we think about giving people vocabulary to be able to decide that, to discuss their own lives? So basically, using Robinson's work, I look at how censorship attempts are often harmful because they deny children both agency and the vocabulary to describe their own lives. So just a bit more on reading practices. I look at reading practices through time. So this is where some of my work in religious studies comes in. And I like to start with this picture. So if we look at the monks, and I promise this will make sense, uh, who from the Middle Ages, what we can see is that in the West, how people think about reading has changed over time. So the monks are actually reading in the rectory, and you'll see that someone is reading out loud. Reading out loud is incredibly important for book challenges, because when you read silently, no one knows what you're reading, and no one knows where you are in the text. Also, most importantly, no one can correct you. So when I see people who are uh, challenging, when I look at what they say, they'll say something like, um, well, that is a bad book because you can't read it out loud in a classroom, right? That is something that makes a bad book. And this is actually something that has developed from when we look at the Middle Ages. There's also this idea of the four levels of interpretation. So this looks at how people looked at interpreting the Bible over time. This would be the idea of looking at it as like, say, an allegory. In the early modern era, <clears throat> we really see the rise of um, a new relationship with the written word and how people, the text became mediated. So if we look at the Reformation era, this is also very important for thinking about challenges because what the reformers did was say that there is nothing between you and the text. Everything you need for salvation can be found in this book, right? That's all you need. Um, this is the doctrine of sola scriptura for anybody who is interested in this. Um, but actually, it worried the reformers very much that people would interpret incorrectly. And so what they started doing is scribbling all around the text to make sure that people would interpret correctly. Um, there's also this doctrine called the priesthood of all believers. So this is the idea that you don't even need to hear from someone else. 
you and the text is all that is needed to reach heaven, essentially. Then as we move towards the modern era, what we see is that there are certain people who are always affected by what they read. And those people are mainly women and children. So the children is pretty self-explanatory, right? That children do not have critical distance from the text. If they read about something, they will do it. But let me explain the word, the one about women a little bit more. So most public libraries, for example, do not collect erotica, however they wanted to find it. But they do collect extremely violent books. So if you go into the horror, thriller, whatever section, you will see that there are tons of books, mostly that are geared towards men. And those books are rarely challenged. No one really says anything about them. They are not part of this discussion about what people should be able to read. Um, this is how we can see that, in fact, our society as a whole do not, does not believe that women and children have critical distance from the text. In fact, they have undisciplined imaginations. <clears throat> this comes from Davidson, and she talks about how when we think about interpretation, we really think about this idea that there are some people who will simply do what they say, what the text says. Just a little bit more on this theory. Uh, this is actually linked to Scottish common sense philosophical tradition, uh, which we actually see in our founding documents, where we say things like, we hold these truths to be self-evident. This is the idea that the text is self-evident, that the text means what it says and says what it means. And I hear challengers say this all the time. Well, you just have to read it and you can see what it says. That's what it says. As if that is just clear to everybody. Um, <clears throat> when we think about things in terms of reading practices, it's a little bit easier to see why people are thinking about books in particular ways. So I just want to show this from last year. You can actually look over at the ALA website and see the censorship. Um, this is actually the stats from 2021. We do not have the full stats from 2022 yet, although American Library Association released stats halfway through the year we're on record to beat 2021 so you can actually see reasons for uh why things were challenged some of my favorites are here are woke uh profanity um indoctrinating kids obscene those are the larger ones that i can see but some of them are just really what you would expect So what does it look like when someone challenges a book? So this is from the uh, Moms for Liberty. They're upset about the wit and wisdom uh, <coughs> curriculum that was offered in Tennessee. And they talk about how this is very dark and divisive. And it focuses on um, particular aspects of American history that lead people to feeling uh, resentment and shame about their color, their skin color or fear. But I wanna say that the most interesting thing about this is actually the books that they challenge. In particular, they challenge Ruby Bridges book, Ruby Bridges Goes to School by Ruby Bridges. They're upset about pages two to three, which depict photographs of a neighborhood sign that reads, we want white tenants in our white community and a smiling white boy holding a sign that says, we won't go to school with Negroes. Page 14 to 15, this is a group of white people holding up a sign that read, we want segregation and we don't want to integrate. So I wanna say first that these are photographs, right? These are not doctored pictures, they show actual people. Also, this is Ruby Bridges telling her own story. Ruby Bridges is still alive. But most interesting, they are upset about this picture. This is by one of our most avant-garde artists, Norman Rockwell. He painted Ruby Bridges being taken to school uh, by these US Marshals. The name of this painting is very famous, The Problem We All Live With. 
They are upset about the N-word in the background. I just think it's interesting to think about what they are upset about. Norman Rockwell, who, I, I mean, the Saturday Evening Post, he was on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post. He is an illustrator. They upset about this particular painting of Ruby Bridges. And most importantly, they're upset about Ruby Bridges telling her own story. So this is an example of a uh, request for reconsideration. This is actually for the hate you give. You can actually see that it's redacted so that I wouldn't be able to show, get the information from these people about uh, where they lived. Um, but I just wanna go through this a little bit because I think this really encapsulates a lot about um, <clears throat> how to think about book challengers. So they say they've attached everything to it. Please read through our attachments. They say our children are bombarded, bombarded with bad language. We don't need to continue to push this. They use a very uh, common form of discourse by saying, well, the movie is gonna be rated R, so therefore the book is rated R. Now, any of you who have seen the documentary, this movie is not yet rated, know that in fact that a rated R movie has all sorts of gendered aspects to it. And in fact, it's a small panel of people who put those ratings onto movies. But most importantly, they say at the bottom, <clears throat> we see no literary value to this book. Now, The Hate You Give is a very famous book about uh, the movement for black lives. It really centers um, a young woman who is grappling with the death of her friend and how she is going to respond to it. So when you see something like we see no literary value to this book, you really start to think, well, what do they mean by that? This just gives an example of how I do my analysis. So I look at discourse. Um, I'm not gonna read through all of these, but basically this is something that shows like people are worried about the harmful effects. I mentioned the reading aloud. What I found out is if you can't read them aloud, that that's an indicator that it wasn't a good thing to have in our school. And then I just basically code them that way. This is a, another one that's on institutional reading practices. This is about someone saying that we don't, shouldn't read the bluest eye and that in fact people should have um, other things to read from um, that isn't about legally banning, but about changing our curriculum in order to protect our children. Really when people talk about divor div diverse books, especially related to people who are black, indigenous, and people of color, there's this idea that there is one story that can be told. So you can get a comparable learning experiences by reading something else. You don't have to necessarily read Toni Morrison's book. And also we have um, this idea of the permission form. So that's a form of restriction. I actually got this right from the Patmos Library here in Michigan. Um, this is from 2022. I'll read through it. So here you are again, library board has some huge decisions to make. I am praying for you will, um, you will make wise and truthful decisions about tax dollars should never be spent on rooming material that grooms children by normalizing sex actions. Participating in sexual dialogue is with a minor is illegal. It's called grooming. The content in some books in Patmos Teens Library contains graphic sexual dialogue and narratives. If an adult were to read some of these books in the library to a minor, they would be legally charged. Remember I said that reading out loud is incredibly important. So basically, I'm interested in things about like the themes that we find that people talk about with society. So this is the idea that society operates when you're looking at the discourse of censorship as a fragile backbone for life, that it is in decline. There's a sense of, mo of moral drift. Often challengers see themselves as the only people who are on the side of my morality. There's a lot of issues about how people parent and whether or not people are good parents and how we help parents who are falling down on the job and whether or not public institutions are doing a good job of helping the parents who are falling down on the job. Also lots of issues about how we think about children and what it means to be innocent. Also, I look at things like reading practices, 
I've been showing this slide for a long time, but I love it because I think it's how we think about reading, which is the idea that somehow the pictures jump off the page. Um, so this is an altered book. You can still find them. They're quite beautiful. Uh, but when we think about reading practices, we have the idea that common sense interpretations, um, that text can only be interpreted wrong way, that words mean what they say, say what they mean. Um, the fear of undisciplined imagination, that especially children don't uh, have critical distance from a text, that they will simply do what they read about. So if they read about something, and this is actually something that comes up, especially with the books that are being challenged on gender at the moment, the idea that if my child reads about different ideas of gender, then they will have different ideas of gender and they will change their gender. There's like this one-to-one -one that comes from this. So these are some of the books that are being challenged right now. Actually, a lot of these books have been on the list for an extremely long time. Drama has been on there forever. Um, <laughs> All Boys Aren't Blue is new. I Am Jazz, Jazz's book has been on there since Jazz published that book. Um, Gender Queer, as you can see, is on there. Um, underneath there, with the Toni Morrison, that's actually the bluest eye. So sometimes what people ask me is basically, what can we do, right? What can we do to respond? So I say the first thing you can do is just read a bad book. There is a list of 850 books out of Texas. I'm sure you will find something on there that you like to read. That is from Krause. Just look up Krause list. You'll get the list of 850 books. Just read one of those books. Um, read a book that is outside of maybe your comfort zone. Why does the book make you uncomfortable? What do you think about this book? Why might someone be upset about it? And even if you are upset about it, what does that mean for other people? There might be people who want to think through the ideas that are presented in this particular book. Um, I've been bringing this up more and more, which is really to be prepared. I know that at the moment in uh, higher ed, books and collections are not being targeted. I do not think that's going to continue. I think that we are moving to a world where, in fact, all information, all libraries will be scrutinized for the information that they provide, especially if they're supported by taxpayers. So be prepared. Review your policies. Know who is in charge, who is the board for your given institution. What are their politics? Um, who would come to a meeting if there is a challenge? I just want to say that these kids on this side were uh, successful um, in getting their books back. Um, and I do not think these kids were success successful over here. But organizing is always important. Also, you should know that there are national communities you can look at. So the Freedom Tree Foundation is the legal arm of the American Library Association. When things come up that are in uh, various state laws, in the courts, this is how librarianship responds. The Unite Against Book Ban is actually a coalition of various organizations. You can just go and see the different work that is being done. Um, I have to mention the National Coalition Against Censorship. Uh, this is actually a true coalition. Um, if you go to the list, you'll see that it's an interesting list of various organizations. I think there are about 50 to 100 different members of the coalition um, that come together to discuss freedom of expression and to basically support people who are working to make sure that everyone has the right to um, information access. PEN America, if you're a writer, this is where you go. PEN America is doing wonderful work. Um, I encourage you to check out their uh, different author um, talks. And if you are a writer yourself, this is really where you would go to be supported um, if something happens to one of your books. So this is my favorite poster from the American Library Association. 
because I think it actually encapsulates my work, the idea that words have power. And in fact, that is why people try to ban books. We actually think about books, they have an outsized sort of power in our society. They aren't just an object. We think about books as meaning something that is, should be true. Actually, we actually think about the object of a book, interestingly, too. When I talk to my students, I sometimes have them raise them, I'm not gonna ask you to do this, how many of you break the backs of your book, the spines? Now, there are people who will never, ever, ever do this. And I get these horrified looks. And I'm like, but it's a mass market object. There are lots of these books around. But if you think about how people think about the object of a book, it's actually much more than just a mass market object. So I just want to read, leave you with this. This is actually the tagline from Freedom to Read Foundation, um, that free people read freely. I am extremely concerned about everything that is happening across the country right now. Um, our right to intellectual freedom, to freedom of expression are being trampled on. Um, I talk sometimes to people at, in Florida, um, how they are responding to their governor's actions, it's actually just a very frightening time for many of them. So I leave you with a charge. Get involved in your local community politics because it is actually up to you and every single one of us to make sure that everyone has the right to read because free people read freely. Thank you. Begin with a question in chat here for Emily. Do you have hope that the current book banning frenzy will settle down eventually? It will settle down eventually, but not anytime soon. We are going through reactionary time in our country. So um, I basically date this back to, if you look at generations, you know, we're coming out of the civil rights movement and it's kind of a culmination with the election of Barack Obama. And then we had a reactionary election. And at the same time, we are moving towards being a majority minority country. And this is very difficult for many, many people. And what we are seeing is that we are not sure how to talk about our country, what our society will look like as we move to 2040. So um, I'm not expecting anything to quiet down anytime soon. Um, as many of you know, everybody who's under 18, like that is already a majority minority um, uh, group of people in our, in our country. So I think that we just have to go through this. The only way out is through. And so um, we have to just decide how we're going to respond and how we'll be prepared as we move through this incredibly difficult time. Hi, thank you for your talk. Sure. Um, I'm a faculty member here at Western in the libraries, and we have a different relationship with um, book, book banning and censorship in academic libraries. Uh, is this a false sense of security? Are we, I think about trigger warnings in uh, classrooms that we see, but in libraries, are we facing the same challenge or the same situations? Yes, we are. Um, let me explain how I think this is going, this is happening. So you have to imagine that you are living under the Stop Woke Act in uh, Florida, right? So it's starting with academic freedom, right? But there is no reason why, for example, 
the uh, <clears throat> the board at New College in Florida won't say, well, we need to look at the library's uh, collection development policy. We need to go through and see what books are on the shelf. I'm expecting them to do that any day. It might be the last thing they do, right? Like they're gonna do a bunch of other stuff first, like they fired the president, right? They have all sorts of other things they, on their minds. But eventually they'll look at the budget and they'll say, gosh, that's a lot of money going to the library. What is the library doing? What do they have over there? We should walk over there. Right? Um, you must be prepared for that. I do not think that any public institution is safe right now. This is, so I, I highly recommend reading The Some of Us by Heather McGee, um, who talks about how we think about public goods within our country. And basically, you know, we've had the divestment of, from public um, education since, um, you know, it wasn't just for white men. Um, and so now we have more and more people who are not white men going to these uh, institutions. They will all be under scrutiny because people say things like, well, I'm a taxpayer and I get to decide what goes on at a particular institution. Another question online. Uh, this comes from Teslin Magnuson at PEN America, and she asks, what are some of the things we should be counting? She put that in quotes, i.e. book bans, the why, the where. Oh, tell her hello. I, I follow her on Twitter. Um, <laughs> oh, did I kick something? I hope that's okay. Okay. Um, so I think we should count as much as possible. So I'm really excited that so many people um, are looking at uh, all the different things happening across the country. So um, I'm hoping that we can get a consolidated bibliography, but I think we should count um, whatever you find. So if you hear about something, just write it down. Um, that is sort of what I'm thinking about. Think about databases, uh, art exhibits, all sorts of things. Everything counts right now. And after we do the counting, we'll figure it out. But let's just collect as much information as we can, and then we'll decide what we should include and not include. What I don't want is for someone to say, well, I'm not sure about this, right? Just include it. Um, we can make the, just those decisions in 30, 50 years. One, I, I wanted to uh, express my appreciation for your description of the undercurrents of what brings people to a place of how we understand both information and reading and, and sort of the social context. So I really appreciate that. Um, and also, I just wanted to highlight, you mentioned some national resources for support. Michigan, actually, the Michigan Library Association has brought together a coalition of organizations and individuals in support of intellectual freedom. There are lots of resources there um, and lots of support um, that be has become a springboard even for physical resources, people who will go to board meetings and speak on behalf of in support of intellectual freedom. So the um, the website for that coalition is mi my right to read dot com so that's a place and we've been working for the last year really hard at putting together materials that will help people but again um so resources but this is a people too and sometimes it's helpful just to know that there are people in the trenches who are actually going through these kinds of challenges and to know that they're there are places and people who can help. Yeah, I just also want to add, if, if anybody is going through a challenge, please know who you can call on. Um, I, I am very worried about library staff right now, um, especially in public um, and school libraries um, who are being targeted with violence. Um, you know, make sure you have a friend that you can talk to uh, and someone who will come with you to 
the board meeting. Um, I don't know, so I'm just gonna say, I don't know if any of you saw the new college um, board meeting where they fired the president. She just had to sit there through the rest of the meeting after they fired her. She was in tears, of course. Um, and I was like, it really would have been nice if there is someone who could have sat there with her, right? As she was going through that. Um, in truth, book challenges can destroy a community. Um, often when a library goes through them, the director leaves, the staff leaves. Um, they are just so difficult on your, cell, on your mental health. Um, I don't know how we're going to be recruiting people into being teachers and librarians right now. Uh, it's just very difficult um, work at the moment. So you really have to make sure that you're also taking care of yourself. Hi, um, thanks for, for this fabulous talk. It's been really informative. Um, I'm actually looking forward to the workshops tomorrow as well. Um, one of the things that when we think about uh, book challenges, we're often hearing about these, you talked about the, the moral value issues. And a lot of them are values that are often traditionally seen as more politically conservative. But there have also been instances of <clears throat> book challenges or and other kinds of information challenges from a more progressive liberal perspective. Um, they're not equivalent. <laughs> the, the numbers are pretty clear in terms of just the sheer volume of challenges being um, more common um, from the, the sort of more traditional um, uh, conservative uh, perspectives. But I'm wondering, what are your thoughts about the similarities as well as the differences for why such completely different uh, value systems are still reacting and in, in, in proposing banning of books? Because <laughs> they actually are not different valid, valid, uh, value systems. They are based on the idea that reading a book changes people. So no matter what, so the ones I talk about mostly are, are the books that are by uh, uh, trans exclusionary radical feminists, right? Those are the ones that come up a lot um, for public libraries. But the arguments are the same, which is that this book will harm somebody if they read it. It's not actually a different argument. It's actually the same value. Um, on a professional level, libraries, librarians, library workers should not be in the business of censoring books, censoring materials. That is just not what librarianship is about. I understand, I will talk tomorrow a bit about uh, progressive versus liberal values um, when it comes to information access. Um, librarianship is actually a very classically uh, liberal profession. It, really focuses on the individual and the individual's information needs. The only way you can really start thinking about censoring something is if you're thinking about groups. This is going to hurt this group of people. You're never talking about like the person who's in front of you. And what matters for libraries is the person in front of you. Um, when we start thinking about people um, just being part of groups, and I'll, I'll discuss this a little bit about how we think about group identity, we lose the individual and what they need, what they are trying to understand about the world. Um, and this is what is most important. But the value of books being important is just shared across the Western world. What do you do in your classes if you're a student? You get lots of stuff to read. That's not an accident, right? We give people to read stuff to read so you can change your knowledge structures and r wrestle with issues and wrestle, wrestle with ideas. That is just how we do it. Um, and I, 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 I recommended books for you to read, right? I said the read, I said read the some of us because I want you to wrestle with the ideas that she has. Now, I don't know if you agree with them or not. That doesn't matter to me. I don't care if you agree with it. It's more thinking through the arguments that she has. Um, and that to me is what the important thing is. Also, if you don't agree with it, how are you going to argue with her if you haven't read it? 
that is one of the most important things to think about when you're thinking about the work. So harm is its own issue. Um, I did that work on trigger warnings that goes into its own thing, but mostly people really think that text and wrestling with text is important. Okay, another question from online. This person, I believe, works at Wayne State and is asking, uh, you mentioned the New College example. What can we do to protest the recent events at New College in a meaningful, productive way? At Wayne State, our union is working on a joint statement with the AFT. Do you have other ideas? The truth is, it's too late a lot of times. I, I, I just want to say that very clearly you need to vote first <laughs> you know like i cannot stress that enough you need to seed your board um, to support academic freedom intellectual freedom by the time you get to where new college is it's really late um in that situation i don't know what we can actually do i don't know what can be done um the only thing I can think of to do is that Florida needs to elect a different governor. But the people of Florida have spoken, and this is who they wanted. You have to also wrestle with that idea, right? That it's actually, maybe this is actually what the people wanted. I don't know. So you have to be, you have to sort of think that way. So I think statements are good, but I'm really working much more to get people in librarianship, and a lot of us are really introverts, to be more comfortable with the political process and with speaking up. It is so hard to do. Um, one thing I heard a librarian say, say is that, you know, I realized that in order to really support these books, I had to be comfortable about talking about sex and gender myself, and I wasn't really comfortable doing that. And I was like, oh, that is true. I need to learn to be comfortable with difficult knowledge and saying it out loud. Um, and so doing that work, I'm a little worried about some of the statements because of how language works. Um, I've been talking to people who are like, we should pass this law in um, wherever, some state to talk about like DEI and in inclusion. I'm like, that is not going to work out the way you think it is, right? Those do not have real definitions that are agreed upon by everyone in your state. It is actually best maybe not to bring that forward. Um, so think very carefully about that statement. I would actually ask that you take it to the Michigan ACLU and have the lawyers review it, the First Amendment lawyers, to make sure that it is not something that will be targeted by whoever is upset about something that's happening at Wayne State. I don't, I don't know how else to say that, right? Like, um, this is really, I, I know we all want to be out there, but sometimes the way we can out be out there is by actually being physically present, um, by doing other types of work. Um, I am actually a high school librarian and you said to count everything. Where do you count stuff? Like, where would you report these so random things? You can report it to the ALA. You can send it to me. <laughs> uh, we have a list in the uh, uh, Journal of Intellectual Freedom and Privacy. We try to keep a track of everything. PEN America is tracking. Every library is tracking it. But the easiest way to do it is actually just to send it to the forum at ALA, whatever might come up. Um, if your principal is removing things, just things are disappearing, right? I know that happens. Uh, principals don't like parents being upset at them. Um, so just let us know that is a, uh, a form uh, that is, um, no one knows that you have, you have sent that form in, right? So it's confidential. Okay, last question from online. What advice do you have for future educators slash teachers who want to teach banned books in the classroom as well as the history of banned books in America? 
make sure your administration supports you doing that. Um, you might be putting yourself on the line. You have to decide about your own obligations. Um, sometimes there are other ways to support people. Um, think through how you want to discuss history. Uh, one of the things I talk about with my students is that we have not even grappled with how we're going to discuss January 6th in the world. Um, but make sure that you are supported by your administrator because your uh, administration because and how much risk you are willing to take. I think that's really also very important. Um, I was just listening to a podcast and someone in Florida, another professor, said that he had decided not to teach the classes that he usually teaches because he's the breadwinner for the family and they had just had a baby, right? You, everybody has to make their own decision. Um, but if your principal is not going to support you, you will be hung out to dry. And so just be aware of that. Can you point to an institution, organization, or library in community um, that is doing really well communicating about banned books? Yes, so actually it's the picture of York, York, Pennsylvania, um, that I showed. It's this one. Oh, so, sorry, you can't see it. <laughs> I can see it up here. Um, it's on my right. Um, the students there organized. And there's nothing more important than student voices, bringing your kids out so they can see how civics works in real time. Um, they were extremely successful. So I would just look up their, um, their work uh, for how they responded in their school. Also, Freedom to Read, the Freedom, um, F-E-R-A-D, uh, they are doing excellent work in Texas, and I think they are also in Florida. Um, one thing I'm really thinking about a lot is that uh, people who are supporting freedom of expression are not as good as, at organizing as people who are against it, right? So there are Moms for Liberty uh, chapters throughout the country. We don't have chapters, right? <laughs> like, that's not like a thing. These are, gr and people say, well, it's AstroTurf. I'm like, okay, you know, I mean, what does it matter? They show up at the, at the board meeting. It doesn't matter if they're AstroTurf or not. Are you showing up at the board meeting? Like that is the sort of the way I'm trying to get people to think much more about their local community um, and politics. Um, you can see that like this is something all the way through from local to federal, that we are just not um, as savvy with thinking through long-term consequences of being involved with politics. Um, and the library is a political institution. It is, this university is a political institution. It's supported by the public. Um, and thinking about what that means is something that we really have to, to strive toward getting better at advocating for our public goods, our public resources that are available to all. Thank you.